it's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and welcome to today's tutorial. In this video, I'm going to be showing you my digital painting process for this illustration I've created here of the Phantom. I'm going to take you through the initial idea phase where I lay down the foundations of the artwork, figuring out what the composition is going to be and the elements that I'm going to include within the illustration. After that, I'm going to choose a desirable color scheme that's going to be aesthetically pleasing to the audience and then block in the shadows and the highlights, really bringing out those forms and ultimately rendering the illustration into the finished piece of artwork that you see here in front of you. I hope you enjoy the video and that you get something out of it and uh, I'll see you in a bit. Thanks for watching. All right, so here we are in Photoshop, about to crack into another digital painting illustration, this time of the Phantom. Now, I love the Phantom. He's one of my most favorite superheroes of all time. He's the hero that I grew up with, the first hero that I actually started collecting comic books around. So who knows, maybe he got me into comic book art altogether. But as you can see here, I'm starting out just in the same way that I start out every other illustration that I create, whether I'm creating a black and white inked comic book illustration or a digital painting, it begins with a very basic, very rudimentary sketch, which only purpose is to get all the elements laid out onto the page into one aesthetically pleasing composition. So here I'm really establishing the placement of the character, the pose of the character, the proportions of the character, getting some basic background elements drawn in there, and just really seeing what I can come up with, exploring the idea, seeing where it's going to go. And I always find this part to be the most kind of relaxing, but the most creatively taxing at the same time, because at the end of the day, what you're doing here is you're sculpting out the idea. You're actually growing it from the ground up, which is why it's important to try and stay relaxed, as relaxed as you possibly can. Keep it loose. Don't put any expectations on what you think the idea should be. Obviously, I've got a vague idea as to what I want to go for here. I am going to be drawing up the Phantom in his throne with an authority of eminence coming from the overall uh, overall pose that I've chosen for him. You know, I really want to get across that idea that he's kind of like the king of the jungle, the protector of the jungle, the guy that you go to if there's trouble going down. Now, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm just basically laying in some additional muscle anatomy over the top of that basic mannequin model foundation that I laid in initially. Just trying to get the placement of the legs down and, and the arms and basically figuring out how can I compose this artwork in a way in which is going to include all the elements that need to be included in order to really get across the idea that I'm trying to show to the audience. And one of the examples of that is right here where I'm starting to mess around with the pose of the arm of the Phantom. You see, the Phantom, he's got these two rings on either hand, one for protection and one for punishing evildoers. So what I'm really trying to do, because they are an integral costume element to the character, is I'm trying to include both of those rings within the scene at once. So really that's that's something that's important. So I'm kind of messing around with the pose of those arms. I'm kind of like lifting them up, seeing what angles I can draw them on, which is going to, you know, really make the illustration look correct. And sometimes that can be tricky, but I think what the, you really want to do at the end of the day is use those technical skills, the technical skills that you've learned in order to establish a good foundation for your artwork. So for example, establishing the character with form, with the correct proportions, with the correct anatomy, and then fitting that into the context of your ideas like I'm doing here. So I've got an idea, I've got kind of like, you know, I've got a goal here for what I want this artwork to be. Obviously, again, I'm not putting too much pressure on myself to make it anything too perfect early on. You want to keep it vague, you want to keep it ambiguous and kind of let the act of actually creating really build the idea into what it's ultimately going to be. But, you know, in the end, what you're also doing on top of that is you're trying to fit these technical requirements that is going to actually make the artwork structurally sound into, again, the actual context of the idea. So now what I'm doing is I'm just taking my attention into the background, detailing out some of the different aspects about his skull throne there. And I don't really have a reference for the skulls on either side of that thrown head, so I'm just kind of, you know, guessing and spitballing as to what it should look like with my <laughs> very basic uh, memory of, of what a skull should look like. So, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the elements that you're going to be drawing when it comes to comic books, when it comes to digital illustrations of any kind, really, you're not always going to have a solid reference there to draw upon. So you really have to begin to look back into your memory bank and hopefully 
in the past you've done some studies of skulls or skeletons of different parts of the human anatomy that is going to be at least in a general kind of way stored inside your brain so that you can draw upon it when you need to draw upon it and as long as you've got a base down something to work with you know I often say even if the in the beginning the composition of your drawing consists of just circles that symbolize where certain things are going to go that's enough to give you a roadmap to begin building upon to begin building up the idea and fleshing it out sculpting it out again an idea is really just like beginning with a bowl of clay you've got a very kind of weird look and shape that hasn't really been formed into anything just yet but as you kind of squish it and pull it in different directions that clay begins to form somewhat of an idea and then you begin to kind of sculpt it out polish it up into the refined version of what it's ultimately going to be and drawing is very much the same way I've found I've found that you know in the beginning it's very rough and really sometimes my initial sketches are so rough that I'm really the only one who knows what's going on I could ask someone else to have a look and they'd be like dude what are you trying to show here but uh, you know as long as for you you've got enough information there to begin you know getting the ball rolling that's all that you really need to do and at the end of the day nobody's going to see those rough rudimentary sketches anyway so you can keep it as, as crazy messy looking as you want but now that I've got a solid foundation down for the artwork, what I'm doing now is I'm picking the base colors that the general color scheme is going to be made of. You know, picking the colors for the phantom suit and ultimately what the colors of the background are going to be and making sure that the colors that I'm picking there are actually going to fit together well as a whole in an aesthetically pleasing composition. But, uh, what you might notice if you are a Phantom fan like myself is that I haven't opted here for the typical purple tights. In fact, I've gone for a more of a dark navy blue with some red undies there, and you might be asking why that is. Well, in fact, that's because around the world there's actually different versions of the Phantom. So in Scandinavia, you've got this navy blue. In Italy, Europe, you've got the, the red Phantom, also known as the red mask. And then in America, Australia, you've got the, the purple phantom but originally the phantom actually started out as being gray he didn't really have any color attached to him in his design and he was known as the gray ghost in fact which later became the phantom so the reason that I've gone for the Scandinavian Phantom in particular with this artwork is because, you know, I was at my local comic book store the other day and I found the best statue ever of the Phantom. It was this 12-inch Scandinavian version of the Phantom statue and I knew that as soon as I saw it, I needed it in my studio, not only to inspire me, but just for the fact that it was the Phantom, the one superhero that I, I grew up with as a kid because I couldn't afford the fancy Marvel DC comic you know all I could afford from my from my you know pocket money piggy bank was um the black and white two dollar phantom comic book issues from my local news agents so uh you know the phantom was definitely the the character that I grew up with especially because he was in the newspaper I remember as a kid actually cutting out the individual comic strips and sticking them into this giant scrapbook creating my own kind of homemade comic books of the phantom and uh yeah I remember you know creating a whole bunch of these actually and whenever I'd go over to somebody's place where there was my friends or you know even even a family friend's place I'd always uh, try to nab and, and figure out where they stored their newspapers so that I could collect the old Phantom comic book strips from them and cut them out and again put them into my scrapbook collection of Phantom comic book strips. So I was very stoked the day that I got my first actual Phantom comic book from my dad. He bought me a Phantom comic from the newsagent just because, you know, back in the day he was the mailman around the, the countryside town that I actually grew up in and because there was a lot of acreage, a lot of land between each one of those mailboxes oftentimes the mail run that we would go on would often be you know up to six hours long straight of driving so he'd buy me these comic books just to kind of keep me occupied on the way which you know he apologized because they weren't the fancy comic books that you know DC and Marvel and Iron Man and Superman and uh, you know I, I honestly didn't mind I was over the moon because I loved the Phantom already and to actually have a comic book there in my hand that wasn't a scrapbook it was an actual published book I was, uh, I was absolutely happy with that, and that's what actually began my comic book collection of the Phantom. But uh, back to the painting at hand, as you can see here, 
I'm, uh, I'm kind of laying in some base shadows, some base highlights, and in a little bit I'm going to start to add in the overlays of shadow and the overlays of highlight that are actually going to give the piece a little bit more color and enrich the color palette altogether. So I'm working on the background a little bit, trying to get the actual focal point of the Phantom to stand out, so really against the background. You know, you don't want to really make it too complex in the background, so much so that it takes away from the main center of focus, which again in this case is the Phantom because if you do that oftentimes it's just going to kind of flatten out the image and there's not going to be a whole lot of depth. The viewer won't really know where to look first. So uh, you always want to keep that in check and that's why oftentimes I'll try to keep my backgrounds kind of, you know, simple, not too detailed, not a whole lot going on. Just enough there to kind of establish the mood and give the character a little bit of context, a little bit of story. Uh, but as you can see here, I'm laying in that shadow and highlight overlay. I've opted for a warm shadows, cool highlights color scheme here, which, you know, if you bounce warm colors and cold colors off of one another, oftentimes you're going to get something which is, <laughs> again, it's going to look appealing to the viewer. I don't know why, don't ask me. I guess in nature, oftentimes, that's the kind of color scheme that you're dealing with. You're dealing oftentimes with warm highlights, cool shadows, or warm shadows and cool highlights one or the other and you can kind of pick between those two variations oftentimes and end up with something which is going to work well but now that I've laid in the, the the shadow overlay and the highlight overlay, I've got quite a good color scheme going on. All of those colors kind of have a, a new a, a richness and, and vibrancy to them and a little bit more variation in comparison to the initial base colors, base highlights, base shadows. Now we've got an overlay of color over the top of all of them, which has actually, you know, made them a little bit more realistic. You know, oftentimes we've all got our local colors. We've all got our base colors. For example, me now, I'm wearing a black hoodie. I've got brown hair, I've got some blue jeans on, and under a neutral light source, all those local colors will be pretty much exactly those colors. But if you stick me in a room with a red light, where the only light in that room is, is a dark red, then those colors are actually going to change visually. The hues of those colors will be presented differently. You know, for example, if I was to do an actual painting of myself under those lighting conditions. So here, what we've got is the Phantom with his local color. Colors, so the navy blue, the red undies, and I'll go back into why I actually chose those colors in just a second. But um, so he's got his blue navy suit on. But underneath the lighting conditions where we've got a, a light blue kind of key light source that's shining down the, onto him and then warmer shadows that's kind of making up the, the bulk of the shadows and kind of describing the forms there in conjunction with the highlights, what we have here is a bit of a blend between the actual primary base colors and the overlays of light that are being cast down over the top of the Phantom in almost the, the same way that you'd put a see-through piece of colored cellophane over the top of an object, it would actually change the colors, the underlying primary base colors of that object. So uh, back to why I decided to in create the, in the, the, to present the Scandinavian version of the Phantom in this particular illustration. Now the thing is, when I saw that 12 inch Phantom figure in the comic book store, um, it was actually not the the actual purple phantom. In fact, it was the Scandinavian version of the phantom, which, you know, I actually like that color scheme a little bit better for some reason. I just feel like that navy blue suit looks cooler and with combined with the red undies, he, he, it's kind of, there's a little bit more variation, a little bit more contrast going on there within his color scheme. So uh, I guess that's what inspired me to do this particular piece. You know me, whenever I do a piece of fan art, I like to give it my own spin. And although this is an exactly my own spin. It is a bit of a different take on the typical kind of phantom character that everybody knows. So for me, that's why I ended up doing it in the way that I did it. But what I'm doing here, now that I've got those, those colors down, is I've created a brand new layer over the top of all of them. And this is kind of like what I like to call my render pass one, where I'll begin to color pick from the new color palette that I've created with the overlaying layers that of, of shadow and, and highlight that I've placed on top of those base colors. And now I'm just kind of, I'm noodling out the details. I'm really starting to sculpt out that anatomy, describe it with a new level of refinement and sharpness. And that's what I'm going to do essentially from here on out. I'm just going to build on top of what's there. And that's oftentimes the overall workflow of what an illustration is going to take. You're going to be building it up as you go. You're going to start out rough. You're going to start out broad. And you can see here, even 
even as I work, I'm working from a distance. I want to have an overall view of how this thing is going to come together. And as I get into the nitty gritty details, I'm going to zoom in further and further, upping the resolution of detail and sculpting it out to a more polished level, a sharper level of detail. And for this one, I actually wanted to put a little bit more time into it because the Phantom, you know, he's he's my favorite superhero of all time. I wanted to give him justice in this tribute. So I decided to spend an extra hour or so. Usually I spend about four hours on these digital illustrations. So I spent about five hours all up on this one. And, uh, and it was totally worth going back in there and just polishing it up a little bit more, blending the different tones of his anatomy together to really smooth them out and give it a finished polished representation but as you can see here what I'm doing is I'm laying in a, a few outlines there around his shoulder and around the key areas of anatomy where the main muscle groups are and the reason that I do that is just to make the phantom or the character within the artwork and the muscles that 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 character is made up of or that are present within the anatomy of that character, I want to make them distinct. I want to make them sharp. And the best way that I've found to do that is by actually laying down contour lines that are describing those different areas of anatomy and the outline, the silhouette of the character themselves using a darker tone color. And you can see there around the outside of his arm, and I will actually go in there and really articulate that out a little bit later on. Around his arm, I've actually used some very darker, much, much darker versions of the navy blue base color that I've used for his suit. And I'll tend to do that throughout the illustration. Even the skull there on the end of his skull throne actually has a darker outline around the outside of it, just again to really get it to have that additional level of pop. But what I'm doing now is I'm placing in the rings of the Phantom on his hands, and you can see that the hands in different areas of the Phantom's anatomy there, it's still very, very rough. Even in the background, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity going on with some of those forms. And one of the things that I will say, is, just going back to the amount of detail that you want to balance out with the key focal elements of the artwork and the background elements, you want to make sure that, you know, as detailed as I've kind of interpreted that skull to be on his skull throne, and, you know, later on I'll add in some different textures for what the materials of that throne is made of, which is, you know, obviously some kind of stone, kind of bone-like material. Um, you know, I'm going to still keep that pretty loose. I'm not going to articulate it 100%, but I want to give the viewer the kind of uh, I want to present it to them in a way which is going to get them to kind of just uh, trick them essentially into believing that there's more detail there than is actually present. And that's, you know, it's something that you just want to do because it's the way in which our eyes actually work. Whatever we're focused on, everything else beyond that actually kind of blurs out of our, our visual perception. It actually kind of becomes blurrier. You know, if you look at this video right now and you're focused on it, you can see it right here in front of you. Within your peripherals, any think that you can see is kind of ambiguous. You can see maybe a few different shapes there, maybe on your desk if you're watching this at your desk or if you're watching it on your phone on the train to work or something. Everything within your peripheral vision is actually kind of blurry besides the point at which you're focused on. And that's exactly what's happening here. What I'm trying to get happening here and to simulate within this particular illustration and any illustration that I create, what I want to do is I want to bring the main subject into focus, make it sharp, make it refined, and every Everything else that's not, you know, that's secondary to that, I want to make sure that essentially it's it's basically blurred out of focus because that's going to give that visual simulation a little bit more credibility and it's going to give the artwork depth. It's going to give it a certain amount of visual captivation on another level of immersion that you really do want to incorporate into all of your illustrations at the end of the day. But uh, as you can see here, in saying that I am kind of taking my attention over to the background there, just placing in a few highlights for that skull, really trying to sculpt out the forms that it consists of to uh, to at least a minimal degree of detail. And now I'm placing in the specular highlights for the Phantom's uh, gun belt there. Now for this particular interpretation of the Phantom, I felt that I needed to bring that gun belt up his waist a little bit more to have it kind of wrapping around the entirety of it. Um, that is one thing that I was kind of a little, that I would have changed about the 12 inch phantom statue that I got if I was in charge of sculpting it. I just would have made the gun belt a little bit thicker going up his waist and resting just underneath the second, uh, the second set of abdominal muscles. But, uh, hey, you know what? At, at the end of the day, that's really the only, um, 
the only thing that, that I have a problem with with it, that statue. Beyond that, it's got some really great anatomy sculpted into it. So it's it also serves as a really great anatomy reference. And, and as I said before, you know, when it comes to being a creative person, when you're an artist, you're going to have some days when you're feeling creative and you're going to have other days where you're just feeling kind of flat and not in the mood to create anything at all. So one of the reasons in which I surround myself in my studio with cool action figures, statues that, that are going to inspire me and posters of the artists that have influenced me and inspired me to actually draw in the first place, when I'm able to kind of step into this studio and feel just all that kind of inspiration hitting me all at once, it's almost impossible not to be in a creative mood. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, you're either the kind of person who sees something that really inspires you and has to start to create immediately just because you've been inspired, or, you know, you, you're just not that creative. <laughs> so, But at the end of the day, one of the things that um, I always wanted to have as an artist was not to be at the whim of my moods, not to be at the whim of whether or not I was suffering some kind of creative artist block. That was just not going to work out for me because in the end, you have to be able to create this stuff each and every day. If you're a comic book artist working in a studio and you're on a deadline, you can't just you know not work one day because you're not in the mood to work or you're going through some kind of artist block. You have to be able to somehow cultivate the motivation to be able to jump into something and deliver on whatever that thing is that you have to create whatever that product is regardless of how creative you're feeling and look that's just the reality of the situation if if you stop working and this is your job then at the end of the day that's uh that's something that you're going to to suffer from so you want to be able to make sure that you're able to kind of click into creator mode into that artsy kind of you know <laughs> that mode where you're able to create something just re regardless um whenever you need to at will basically so the best way in which i've found to do that is to surround myself with as much creative inspiration as i possibly can and uh, that's why sometimes every now and then i'll splurge on a brand new phantom statue because because I feel that it's a worthy investment. If it's going to help me to get into my creative mindset, the creative space that I need to be in in order to produce something like this, and really, this is what that is what inspired this illustration in the first place, then so be it. It's a good investment. So, <laughs> you know, I often don't kind of splurge my money. I'm actually quite a good saver. So um, I'm, I'm proud of myself for that. But every now and then I am tempted, and I just couldn't leave that comic book store without taking that phantom statue with me and sitting it in my studio. So uh, that's, uh, that's what happened there and uh, probably won't be uh you know treating myself to anything like that for a while <laughs> again but uh hey you know it was again it was totally worth it so here what you can see me doing is focusing in on the phantom's face which n is really the the primary primary center of focus uh, beyond just you know the, the phantom being the main subject of the artwork the face of the phantom is probably even more important so i really am going to take the time to zoom in there and really make sure that i've got that uh, sculpt it out to the nth degree to a very refined level of intricacy. Um, but what you can see me placing in now is just some cast shadows. Uh, and what that's really doing is it's helping the Phantom stand out even more and pop off against the throne background that I've got framing him there. And the way in which I've placed in those cast shadows, you know, around the underside of his jaw there and around the underside of his peck, and of course onto the, the, the cast shadow that's casting off onto the back of the throne there, the way in which I done that without losing any of the underlying detail, any of that underlying rendering that I'd already placed in, was by placing those cast shadows on what's called a multiply layer within Photoshop. So that's the mode in which I used in order to do that. So that's just, you know, if you're a Photoshop user and you do your digital artwork within Photoshop, one of the tricks that I use in order to place in cast shadows without losing any of the rendering that I've already done, any of the articulation of the forms that I've already placed in, is by placing those car shadows on a multiply layer. So, you know, there's different modes for the different layers within Photoshop that you can use. Usually, I'll just keep it on a normal mode unless I am, you know, laying in special effects like car shadows or, you know, again, with the shadow overlays and the highlight overlays, oftentimes I use them in order to actually enrich the color palette and make sure that I've got something that's, you know, again, visually compelling. What you can see me placing in here now is just a curves adjustment layer, which is going to allow me to ramp up the contrast in the artwork and to really make those forms pop a little bit more, really intensify the color of the lighting and to just 
just give again the that artwork a little bit more sharpness and the other thing that i've just done actually is something that is quite important important to actually the the artwork itself I've placed the phantom in his throne within the skull cave. So what I've tried to indicate here is a certain amount of density within the atmosphere of the environment. And I've got this kind of like fog type effect that the light is actually being cast through essentially. And the way in which I've managed to achieve that was by placing in a layer over the top of everything else, picking a, a very soft blue light uh, airbrush and just projecting that light across the overall artwork and what that did was again it allowed me to produce this kind of fog effect with the lighting which really helped me to uh, give the impression that the atmosphere within the particular environment that I was placing the phantom in was quite dense and that again just helps to uh, indicate exactly what type of environment we've got the character in and it also allows us to uh, make it a more convincing environment which is going to only draw the viewer in at the end of the day and get them more immersed more invested in the artwork and suspend that disbelief um, oftentimes I feel that having a little bit of a background in there can just really at times uh, again just uh, allow you to tell a bit more of the backstory of the character and to really get them at the end of the day with a little bit more context get them actually situated within their own world grounded within their own reality with the, which again just draws the viewer in it really does help the viewer to make sense of what they're seeing and to see the character not just in some black void but to actually see them within the world of their own and that is something that you want to do you want to you want to pull the, the viewers into the world of your characters and that just doesn't go for a digital illustration like this you also want to draw them into the worlds of the comic book narrative itself so again taking the time to actually place in a little bit of background can actually do wonders for the amount of immersion that you're going to create for your audience um, now what you can see me doing here is just a, again messing around with a bit of the rim lights and this uh, rim light is actually going to help me to again get the phantom's head to pop off even more against that thrown background which is actually quite important because I felt like I was losing it a little bit there like the shadow side of the phantom's head was blending in just a little bit too much to that throne and so what I've done here is I placed in that that yellow secondary highlight across the side of the shadow side of his head on the underside of his peck as well you can see a bit of it happening there and what that does is it produces a little bit of a cinematic aesthetic to the lighting setup that we've got going on here but it also helps you to essentially frame your characters with that with that secondary highlight so um it, it basically all you have to do in order to do that is just leave it till last actually place in the primary highlights the primary shadows and then once you're ready to move on to those secondary lights literally just begin to work that secondary highlight into the shadow side of your characters and the shadow side of the forms of the anatomy that is making up that character and that'll be that'll be pretty much a as easy as it can get so what you can see me doing here is, again, just messing around with the curves a little bit, making sure that all the, the tones and the values and the colors are actually, you know, uh, intensified and balanced out to the right degree of detail. You can see me adding it a little bit more specular there to the shadow side of the Phantom's uh, head hood, I should say, uh, just to give the impression that his outfit is made of kind of like this leather type material. But again, just going in there, really making sure I've added those finishing touches to the Phantom's face, trying to articulate those forms and really get the look of the Phantom down. You know, I think that no matter what you're drawing, if there's a character within the composition that you're creating within the illustration, then you're going to want to make sure that you pay special and close attention to that character's face because that's exactly where the viewer's eyes are going to latch on to first. That's how we attempt to relate with what we're seeing first and foremost. When you are talking or conversing with another person, you're not looking all around the place, you know, at the background or, you know, at the clothes they're wearing or at the, the body or anything like that. Um, hopefully you're looking at their face uh, as they're talking. 
talking to you and we look at the face for a reason. We look at the face so that we can try and gauge, you know, what the emotional state of that person is and to relate with them on an emotional level. So uh, just out of instinct, out of habitual instinct, what we're going to do if we're looking at an illustration, if we're looking at a comic book narrative, is we're going to latch on to the faces of those characters regardless if they're real or if they're interpreted in a comic book styled format. So now just as a uh, finishing touch, I'm playing around with the selective colors within the artwork, with, which basically just allows you to go through the individual colors that the artwork consists of and kind of tweak them as you see fit. But uh, I think I end up kind of throwing this out because I realized later on that the original colors that I'd been creating were already good to go. So, you know, sometimes I, uh, I, I make weird little mistakes like that. You can see I've actually switched it off. And uh, really, the only adjustment layers that I do use most of the time are going to be the curves adjustment layer, the levels adjustment layer, and of course, especially the color balance adjustment layer. But uh, beyond that, that's pretty much all there is to this illustration. I really hope that you got a lot out of it. I know it's deviated a little bit away from, again, the typical kind of black and white penciled inked comic book art that we usually create uh, on this comic art based channel but I hope that you still got a little bit out of this because at the end of the day there's a lot of comic books out there now that have digitally painted covers of the stories that are within them and so I think that as a comic book artist especially if you're an indie comic book artist and you want to create an eye-catching cover for your comic book then knowing a little bit about this stuff at least uh, to a a vague degree is going to really help you out in in creating something that's going to really do justice to the story within your comic so you know and sometimes you just want to broaden your skill set again at the end of the day if you're doing black and white comic book art that's going to be the hardest thing that you ever do that's going to be the way way tougher than doing these digital illustrations so why not kind of step into and explore this part of the process as well because it's going to be it's going to be a total cakewalk in comparison comparison to the, the black and white line work. Uh, let me tell you, I've done both for a very long time and the black and white line work takes a lot longer to produce. If I was doing a black and white line work where I was rendering it out with just ink, this illustration would have taken a much, much longer time. It would have took way more than just five hours, let me tell you that. So again, check it out. Try out some of the techniques that I showed you in here. I know that it was a, a bit of a quick one. Again, it's crazy how fast half an hour can, uh, can get eaten away, isn't it? But um, again, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more comic art tutorials. Leave me your thoughts and feedback and suggestion in the comment section below this video and uh, also if you'd be, like to be kept in the loop on up and coming articles, tips and tricks, be sure to head on over to howtodrawcomics.net and sign up to our emailing list where I'll inform you when there's new tutorials coming out, new courses, that kind of stuff. And while you're there, why not check out the comic art community, the growing comic art community that we've got going on over at the site. Share your artwork, leave feedback, get feedback, meet fellow comic artisans and become a part of the community. I'd love to see you there. I'm always there. I love the place. I think it's a fantastic little community that we've got growing over there and it's a great place to get involved and grow together as comic book artists. So uh, thanks again for watching. It's been a pleasure. I'll catch you next time.